So quick overview, we're going to South Africa. <laughs> That was pretty quick. We also have Roxy right here as well. If you guys know Roxy Barrett, she's upside down. There she is. She's physically going on the trip. We're not virtually bringing her. She's actually going to be there. Uh, so we are forming a partnership with an organization called Genesis that's out in Port Shepston, South Africa. So pretty much almost as far on the bottom of Africa that you can go. That's where we're going to be, uh, way down on the southeast coast of South Africa. Um, it'll take us just about 38 hours to get there. Um, so we're also going to be spending some time in Istanbul, so we get to learn some Turkish um, on the way there and on the way back. Um, so if you want to know some Turkish phrases, quiz us. Oh, don't, never mind, don't quiz us. Um, but we leave April 6th. Uh, we will be uh, in country for about seven days. In that time, uh, we are going to be visiting a lot of ministries. This is a vision casting trip, and so what we are doing is we will come back with information of how our church can best, partnership, can best partner with this ministry in the future. And then if you're interested in going, our plan is to send a team uh, out to Genesis every year um, and that I'll lead out there. And so we will look at all these ministries. We're doing everything from uh, a Hindu school where we will do a craft with those kids, maybe telling them about Jesus with some bracelets, um, all the way to going into community care to help support the, the medical care that they give to people out in the bush areas of Africa, to a surf school that they started to evangelize to surfers. I don't surf. I don't even know if we're going to... We're going to get to play rugby with them out there, which is scary. Um, so we're going to a baby home. A lot of babies out there are abandoned, um, and they are taken into this home where we will get to support them and love on those babies. And so uh, they have asked us a few things, and, and if you have it on your heart to donate this in the next couple of weeks, um, they've asked us to bring blankets. Uh, they've asked us to bring baby clothes. Um, so if you have it in your heart to donate those things that we can take um, on your behalf out there, uh, we're excited for this, and we're excited for the future to just get to see the impact that, that we get to have partnering with people literally on the other side. Like, if there was an end of the world, like, if it was actually flat, we would fall off. That's where we're going. Um, and so uh, everything's upside down over there. Um, but uh, be praying for us. Be praying for our team. We're taking eight people, eight leaders in our church. The ones that are not here today are Roxy, Carolina, and Jackie. All right? Jackie um, are going as well. So be praying for us. But that's a little overview of the trip. So you give him a hand to come in uh, and pray over us uh, as we leave on April 6th. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for this time that we can just gather as a church family, Lord. Uh, thank you for these uh, lead servants, Lord, who are uh, uh, serving you, Lord, and who are uh, fulfilling the Great Commission, Lord, uh, in this. And we just pray for their safe travels, Lord, uh, that lives are touched, Lord, and that you're able to just use them for your glory, Lord. I just uh, pray that uh, uh, seeds are able to be planted, Lord, that these uh, faithful servant leaders are able to just touch lives and just be touched as well, Lord, and just allow us to continue to grow and just uh, spread your word to the ends of the earth, Lord. And we know there are no ends of the earth, Lord, so just allow us to just continue to spread that uh, continually as we grow, Lord. And uh, once again, we just thank you for these leaders, Lord, and uh, we just pray for their safe travels, and that they're able to serve you and us uh, in this endeavor, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, brother. All right. So as you are praying, if you could keep us in your prayers, we would greatly appreciate that. And if you have a Bible this morning, turn to the book of Genesis chapter 4. The book of Genesis chapter 4. This week is... As uh, Pastor Tim shared earlier, the Passion Week, and uh, today is Palm Sunday, but throughout the week, I invite you to, uh, if, you, if you're quiet time, I invite you to just focus on the final week of Jesus. You can Google a thousand like reading plans to kind of walk you through each day that goes on, uh, it, it, to focus on uh, the gift that he paid, something that we could never pay, and so uh, it's really important to take that time of year. A lot of people this time of year do that. And so I encourage you to do that this week as well as part of your own quiet time. And then for us as a church, uh, next week in preparation for that, uh, we do several things during Easter uh, on that Sunday and on Friday night. And so on Friday night is our Good Friday service. It'll be here at 7 o'clock. If you've never been to our Good Friday service, uh, I invite you to come and be a part of that. It is something that is completely different from what we normally do as a church service. 
Uh, we actually put the chairs in a circle, and we put a cross in the middle, and we reflect upon the death of Christ and all that that means for us in doing that. Our theme this year for Easter is new beginnings, because we've been in Genesis calling this series Beginnings, so I wanted to tie into that. And so the theme for Friday night is uh, to have a new beginning, something's got to die. And so we're going to talk focus on that uh, on Friday night as part of our worship time together. Uh, again, if you've never been, I really encourage you to come be a part of it. It's a very intimate time. It's all of our church family, our Spanish, English. Uh, we do it together for that. And then on Sunday morning, on uh, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, uh, we will have service at 8.30. Weather permitting outside, uh, the Spanish will have a uh, sunrise service at 6.30. I already told the first service, I said, look, if there's no chairs out there when you get here, we're probably doing it inside, okay? So, Because uh, in March, you never kind of know what you're going to get uh, when it comes to, to the weather. And then our service will be in here at 10.15. We'll have small groups and all that stuff as well. But between... The sec this service and the Spanish service at 1130, we will have our extravaganza for our kids. And so I invite you to bring all your kids over to do that. They'll go out and on the soccer field and they can go grab eggs and there'll be candy and prizes in there and all that kind of stuff uh, for them to be a part of as well. So I encourage you to make that a part of it as well as part of your uh, Sunday uh, to do that. In preparation for that, on Wednesday night at 530, we need to stuff eggs. Be excited. Wow. If enough of us show up, it doesn't take that long. And so uh, we, we sit there, we, we stuff the eggs. It's somewhere around 2,000, 2,500 of them, somewhere along there. It might be, even be more than that at this point. And so I encourage you to come, especially if you're in Rooted. This is kind of a service project thing, which is one of the hearts of Rooted. I encourage you to come be here at 530. The more of us that get here at 530, the more we can get it done and get it done quicker. So I encourage you to be back here at 530 for that to help us with the eggs for the extravaganza. Amen? Yes. All right, Genesis chapter 4. The, we're going to be looking at f mostly at 4, but the, the whole reflection is going to go from chapter 4 and chapter 5. And you'll understand why as we get through the message here this morning. I'm going to start reading in Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. The man was intimate with his wife Eve. And she conceived and gave birth to Cain. She said, I have a male child with the Lord's help. She also gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel became a shepherd of flocks, but Cain worked the ground. In the course of time, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Cain was furious, and he looked despondent. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you furious, and why do you look despondent? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's guardian or you may know it as am I my brother's keeper? Then he said, what, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed, alienated from the ground that's opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood you have shed. If you work the ground, it will never again give you its yield. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. But Cain answered the Lord, my punishment is too great to bear. Since you are banishing me today from the face of the earth, and I must hide from your presence and become a restless wanderer on the earth, whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord replied to him, in that case, whoever kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. And he placed a mark on Cain so that whoever found him would not kill him. Then Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Let's pray. 
Our Father, we thank you for a time of worship and prayer. And now as we open your word, Lord, we pray that I would decrease and you increase. Speak to our hearts and to our minds, not just for information, but for transformation. Make us more like Jesus for your glory and your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now, we all have a family tree. Every single one of us in this room have a family tree. Some of you may be uh, into discovering your family tree, and you've done the, the DNA test to find out your lineages and all those other things, and found out you had some things in you that you didn't know you had in you, and neither did anybody else. But we all have a family tree. My grandmother, until she went home to be with Jesus, she kept a, a big, all I can call it is a poster, that had our family lineage on her side from when her, the family came over from Germany in 1789. So on her wall, she had a big thing, and she had the, the ones that came over in 1789, and then she broke it down and broke it down and broke it down, and she just kept adding to it, and then it kept adding to it over the years and years. You know, with doing it in pencil, because you know, in this world today, things change as far as lineages and people who belong on the family tree. But she had that. I think one of my cousins still has that to today. We all have a family tree. And for all of us in this room, our family tree goes back to Noah. And before that, it goes back to Adam. And so, what I called this message today is the Adam family tree. Because what we're going to see today is. What happens in the Adam family tree? There's a lot of things in Genesis chapter 4 that are first. We have the first birth. Eve conceived and gave birth to Cain. We have the first acts of worship where we see uh, the offerings being offered. And, and somewhere in that time, God put those in there. We have the way of Cain, the way of man. We have the first murder. We have cities. We see the first nomadic life. We see the first instances of culture. And we see the first instances of technology as we see things are made with bronze and iron tools. A lot of first in Genesis chapter 4. And what I want to talk about in our few minutes together that we have here uh, this morning is as followers of Jesus, we need to realize or be reminded that we are in a battle. The battle between the way of Cain, which is the way of man, which is the way of the serpent, and the way of God. We should always choose the way of God, because he is faithful. So I want to keep that in mind for you, and we'll close out with that in a few moments. But we need to go walk through this passage and these two passages together as we come through it. So how do we get to the way of Cain? See, it's very important to remember the context in which Genesis was written. We've shared this with you several times, and I'm sharing it with you again. Moses wrote Genesis at a time as the people of Israel were getting ready to go into the promised land. And they still had some things they're trying to figure out, and they're trying to answer a lot of the questions that you may have today about the whys of stuff. Why are things this way? Why did we have to roam in the desert? What's the reason that we had to go through all this stuff? A lot of those types of questions, and God is seeking to answer them through the book of Genesis. And so we get to chapter 4, and we see the way of Cain. Eve gives birth to Cain, and he becomes a farmer. Gives birth to Abel, and he becomes a shepherd. God establishes some system of worship or offerings. That's why they brought him. And he does that at some point in the course of time, as the Scripture tells us. So Cain and Abel make offerings. Cain makes an offering from the ground that he took care of. Abel makes an offering from the best of his flock. God accepts Abel's offering, but does not accept Cain's. And this is where a lot of people, there's a zillion sermons on this particular point in the past. People always want to know, well, what is the difference between Cain's offering and Abel's offering? It's simple. It's the heart. It's the heart. It's the motivation. 
See, God looks at the heart long before He looks at the offering. That's why in Hebrews 11.4 it says this, By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was approved as a righteous man because God approved his gifts. And even though he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. Even back in Genesis chapter 4, it has been about faith. Why do you do what you do? And just looking at the response of Cain tells us his attitude when it came to the offering. Cain gets mad. He gets furious. It's it's a strong word. God seeks to do what we would call an intervention. This parallels very much what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. God questions Abel, where's your brother? I don't know. But he did know. Cain, in his anger and jealousy, premeditatively murders his brother Abel. That's the way of Cain. The way of Cain is the way of man. And folks, it hasn't changed a bit. We're still wrestling with the way of Cain. The way of Cain seeks to be angry at God. I I find this always interesting. I get it. I mean, we live in emotional times, and we're emotional people, and God blesses us to to do that things, but there's just some people in this world. There may be somebody in this room right now, and the church is all across this land. They're in church today, but they are angry at God. Which leads to the question, then, why are you here? I mean, I'm glad you're here. It's always a question we need to ask ourselves. I was listening to a guy I listen to every Sunday morning. Uh, he's a, he's a, a fellow pastor. I, I know him. I know him well. He's a, but I, I just love listening to him preach, and I listen to him on Sunday morning. And he, he asked a great question of his congregation today. And it was just that. Why are you here? Where's your heart today? When you walk through the doors, as you drove into the parking lot, as you walked through these doors, and as you had your tea, coffee, said hello, met each other, met new people, what was your motivation when you walked in the door? Where is your heart as you sit here and listen to me this morning? What are you offering to God? And more importantly, what are you, how are you offering it to God? See, for some people, it's not from the heart. There are many who still live with this idea that I'm appeasing him somehow by being in church today. I'm doing him the favor. There are many who are not here because they're angry at God. A loved one may be gone. A loved one may have cancer. And isn't it funny how that works in our life in the way of Cain, how it's okay for somebody else to have to deal with cancer, but don't make me deal with it. And we tell other people, well, that's just God working his sovereignty and doing something in your life. But when it happens to you, it's okay for you to get angry at him for the same thing. So many of us get angry. Cain is angry at God. Why? Because his offering wasn't acceptable. Why? Because it didn't come from the heart. That's the way of Cain. We live in a world today that most people, I mean, you just talk to, you talk to most atheists, they're only atheists because they're angry at God. God didn't do something the way they thought it should be done, how they thought it should be done, in the way they thought it should have been done, and that way should have been one where they don't have any pain, any suffering, or any consequence for their actions, but it's okay for that to work on anybody else. So the way of Cain is to get angry at God. 
The way of Cain is to listen to your own counsel instead of God's counsel. Now, I don't know who Cain was listening to at this point. It, we can pretty much assume that, that the serpent is having a conversation with Cain just as much as he had a conversation with Eve, and we looked at that last week. And I'm not even sure it was, did God really say, more than it was, see, God doesn't love you as much as he loves Abel. And he plants the seed. You see the language difference from Genesis 2 to Genesis 3? A sin. We, hear, we see the word sin in Genesis chapter 4. Anger, fury, murder, consequence, judgment. Let's just be honest. We all like to listen to ourselves more than God a lot of times. I know better than he does. Just ask me. When God gives us his word, look at what God says to him. Look, if you'd have done what is right, wouldn't you be accepted? He knew what he was supposed to do. Somewhere in the middle of this, God had instructed him. Adam and Eve had instructed him, whoever instructed him, and how to do this. There was a right way and a wrong way. There was the way of Cain, and there's the way of God. See, too often we get caught up in all the man-centeredness of this passage, and it's easy to do because there's so much there to work with, but we really need to look at the God part of this whole thing. So the way of Cain seeks to listen to his own counsel. The way of Cain seeks to su succeed without God. We see that, and we'll talk about that more in a few months. We talked about it earlier. As we go and look through verse 17 and, and forward through the, the line of Cain, we see that this is when culture is developed, and this is where things like technology with brass and, and all that stuff is starting, and iron is starting to be used. And we see all of the, the lute and the fly. We see music. All of these things are, are established through the line of Cain. And we see the ultimate end of this when we get to the Tower of Babel. Many of us wrestle with thinking that God had anything to do with any perceived sense of success that we have had in life. We don't want to believe that. We don't, the way of Cain doesn't desire to give God credit for anything when it comes to that. I worked hard. I studied all this stuff. I did this. I did that. I provided for my family. I did this. I don't need God to succeed in life. And that's where the world is today, isn't it? And maybe where you're at today. I don't need God. I'm doing just fine without Him. The way of Cain seeks to hide from God. Isn't it a remarkable? It's just like Adam and Eve. Why did, you, why did you hide from me, God says? Well, we were naked. We didn't want you to see us naked. Who told you you were naked? Boom. Where's your brother Abel? I don't know where my brother is. I don't, am I his keeper? Am I his guardian? I knew exactly where he was in a pool of his own blood, at his own hand, Cain's hand. And we somehow think that everything that we do in life, if we do it without the coming to church, if we do it without the stuff, if we do it in the closet, if we do it in the darkness of night, if we do it with nobody's around who goes to church, that somehow God doesn't see this stuff. And we lie to ourselves. That's the way of Cain. We seek to hide from God, and we can't hide from God. The Bible tells us that you can't go deep enough in the ocean, you can't go high enough in the skies to hide from God. So quit trying. Seeks to lie to God. Cain lied. He out and out lied. 
It wasn't, it wasn't just like a small little half-truth, like what the serpent did with, with Adam and Eve. This was just an out-and-out -out lie. I don't know where he is. Do you lie to God? You don't have to verbally lie to lie to God. Y'all know that, right? That's why I asked you the question I asked you a few minutes ago. Why are you here? Where's your heart at? You can lie to me. You can lie to everybody in this room. But you can't lie to God. And you can't hide from God. The way of Cain is the way of man. It is the seed of the serpent who is the devil, the accuser. John 8, 44. We looked at this last week. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. This is Jesus talking. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because he's a liar. Because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. Isn't it amazing the lies we believe from Satan? He makes them sound good. He makes them taste good. He makes them feel good. He makes them look good. That's the seed of the serpent. Finally, the way of Cain passes the way to his succeeding generations. Notice Lamech in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 23. And once we get through the line of Cain... We get down here and we keep going through this and, and then we come down here and into oh, I'm sorry, 17 to 24 as we go through this stuff. And see, Cain was intimate with his wife and they gave birth to Enoch. Cain became the builder of a city. We see this technology. We see all this starting to happen. And we get down to Lamech in verse 19. It says, Lamech took two wives for himself, one named Ada, the other named Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of the nomadic herdsman. His brother was named Jubal. He was the father of all who play the lyre and the flute. Zillah bore Tubal Cain, who made all kinds of bronze from tools. Tubal Cain's sister was Naamah. Then look at this. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, wives of Lamech. Pay attention to my words, for I killed a man for wounding me. I, excuse me, killed a young man for striking me. If Cain is to be avenged seven times over, then for Lamech it will be 77 times. And what does that mean? It's like, man, he is going to be bad. It only took seven generations from Adam to Lamech for all of a sudden it'd be okay to have more than one wife, to kill, to murder, and to go the way of Cain. That's what we pass on. That's what Adam passed on to Cain. And Cain passed it on as well. That's the way of Cain. It's the way of man. And the amazing thing about this is yet in the midst of all of this, God shows grace. We see sin fleshed out in its most brutal sense. We see the consequence of believing that the way of Cain is better than the way of God. Cain catches it. Man, he catches himself. Man, he, he, he made a disastrous choice here. God, you can't do that. Man, if you cast me out of here, I am as good as done. What am I supposed to do to eat? He just told him that if you, you're a farmer, but now you're a farmer, and when you farm, you're not going to get a thing. Well, there you go. There's a career change we all want to get approached on, right? Cain knows he's in trouble. He's being banished from the presence of God. And you notice here that you see that God begins to be removed. And if you notice in the line of Cain, we never hear the name of God. Because they don't want the name of God invoked 
Because the way of Cain is not the way of God. God says, I'll put this mark on it. Anybody touches you, they'll, they're going to get it. They'll get zapped seven, seven times over. And they'll know that you have this mark. Don't touch it. We struggle with this. Matthew 5, 45, Jesus talks about this, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he causes the, his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. We just don't like this verse. We're in this crazy, of this crazy time in this world we live in, and we as Christians and followers of Jesus are falling for this stuff like crazy. We somehow feel like we are obligated to see God execute justice in this world. We do. Somebody says something wrong, something harmful, man, now I want to see that person hang. It's not the way of God. Amen. Why do you need to see that? To vindicate what? The way of Cain in your life? Because that's the way of Cain. We're in this political election. We live in a social media world where everybody feels like this vitriol and lack of civility and that we're somehow obligated to see justice. And the Bible's very clear. The only perfect justice that's ever going to be executed in life is going to be when Jesus judges it all at the end. And for most of us in this room who are followers of Jesus, we won't care because we won't be there. Amen. Why do you got to get back at them? It's the way of Cain. Anger and jealousy for a brother or a sister or a friend or a neighbor. Why do you think you're justified in that? You're not. Neither am I. It's the way of Cain. Yet, man, we want to hear it. We want to see it. it. Makes us feel good. Yeah! Go, God! Now, let's quit talking about the way of Cain. Let's talk about the way of God. The way of God is grace and faith. Amen. Abel's offering comes from a heart that loves God and is thankful for his grace. Abel's offering comes from the best he had to offer to God. Let me just take a few moments and let you just reflect upon this. God wanting your money is long before the law was established. Moses wrote the law 600 years before Abraham. And Abraham to Cain going backwards, that's a long time. You're supposed to give an offering out of love for what God has done for you in your life. For the transformation that he's brought in your life. Oh, there's the preacher talking about money again. You need to talk to God about off talking about money. I ain't got none to give. You got time. You got talent. You do have treasure but you're supposed to give it from the heart. That's why the Bible tells us to be a cheerful giver, Amen. to give out of love, to do everything out of love and worship for, their, for our Savior and our Lord. And I should say our Lord and our Savior because it's Lord and Savior. Because he's Lord whether or not you want to call him Savior or not. Abel gave the best that he had. That's why you see the Bible talk about first fruits. And God just set up a system for us to express our love for God. 
and in the law to support the worship of him. So offering to God goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 4. Amen? Amen. We want to do everything for the Lord. We want to give everything for the Lord. We want to give our best. Let me ask you a question. Do you give your best to your boss? Be honest. You're in church. Why not? He don't pay you enough. Who does, right? God paid you with a son. God loves a cheerful giver, one who gives from the heart. That's who he blesses, and that's the offering he blesses. Somebody's asked me about this after the last service. I will say it this way. You may give, and you may, you, the Bible says to give, and you know to give, and, and the people who, when you give, you, the people who receive the, the benefits of that offering will obviously be blessed, but you need to be very careful thinking that you're going to be blessed the way you think you're going to be blessed if you give without love. Does that make sense? There's a huge difference. So what is the way of God? His loved creation in a loving relationship with him, which leads to giving the best he has to offer from his heart. That's what he wants us for you, to, you and I to do. And God gives us a warning and an opportunity to repent from that which he already sees lurking in our hearts. That's why God says sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. And do you realize you have an advantage that Cain didn't? You have the Holy Spirit in you if you're a follower of Jesus. Guess what you can do? Rule over it. Rule over it. 2 Peter 3, 9, Peter says, The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any of you to perish, but all to come to repentance. Why hasn't God zapped you yet? Because he's waiting on you. What are you going to do? Are you going to go the way of Cain? Well, you're already doing that. Why not try the way of God? Amen. Why not try the way of God? His way and plan cannot be thwarted. This is so important. See, folks, there's a big picture thing in this whole passage that you need to understand very clearly. Eve, as we go over to chapter four, uh, excuse me, five, we see at the end of chapter four, Adam was intimate with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. And if you go over to chapter five, you see the line of Seth. Eve gives birth to Seth, and it's from Seth's line that we get another Lamech who gives birth to to a guy named Noah. And so the seed of the woman continues. Folks, here's the big picture that you need to see. See, we get caught up in the minutia of this. It's easy to talk about urgh, offering and, and sin and anger and murder. It's not what this text is about. The Bible is about God. And we look at Genesis 3.15 where it talks about the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And Satan thought he got God's plan when Cain killed Abel. The seed wasn't Cain. The seed was Abel. And so God, because he already knew his plan 
has Eve give birth to Seth, and Seth gives birth to Noah, and we go on through the litany of history, and you can go back and I believe Luke chapter 3, and you can see the line of Jesus in the birth of counts. Satan is spending his days and has been spending his days seeking to thwart the plan of God. That's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, and I also say to you, Peter, that you and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. See, folks, it started back here in Genesis 4. It started in chapter 3, but it fleshes itself in chapter 4. You see Satan seeking to thwart the plan of God all throughout. You read the Old Testament. You see the, the Satan versus the patriarchs. You see Satan versus Israel as it seeks to live out its, its, its purpose and being a mission and, and the place where God resides. You see it lived out with the prophets versus the kings of Israel. You see it fleshed out in the Gospels as Jesus goes to live life. And you see in Matthew chapter 4 where Jesus is driven by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness and after 40 days of not eating or drinking, Satan decides to come to Jesus and he says, here's my way. And we keep going. You keep going on and we see that Jesus goes on, he lives. We celebrate him walking in and the crowds and throngs celebrating the prophet coming. And by next Friday, the way of Cain is fleshing itself out. We see this battle going and raging. We see it in Jesus himself when he's in the garden and he's so stressed about the situation that the Bible says he's literally dropping drops of blood in his prayer time. And he's sitting there and he's having this conversation and he's like, God, if there is any other way, is there, is there another way? Well, here's the problem. The other way is the way of Cain. And finally, Jesus says, yet not my will, but yours. I will go the way of God. Goes through this monkey trial that he has to go through that you can read about this week. Gets to Friday and then he's hung on a Roman form of capital punishment. And they nail him up there and he dies. He is dead as dead can be. And you can hear Satan saying, I won. They bury him. Roll a rock in front. Three days later, that one who was dead as dead can be is alive. Amen. Satan's plan cannot thwart the way of God. Amen. That's why it says in Hebrews 12, it says, And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and, the, and to the sprinkled blood, which says better things than the blood of Abel. John 16, Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. Amen. See, folks, I get it. Today we can become really frightened by what's going on in the world. Uh, it seems that the, the way of Cain is raging more and more and, and coming to fruition faster and faster. We live here in this country. We live in the United States of America. We are blessed to live here. And if you're old enough, you remember a different time and a different day, and you're praying for that to somehow happen again. And the problem is God is not looking back. God is looking forward to the time when Jesus rules and reigns, and so should we. First John 3, beginning in verse 11. 
For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Unlike Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Folks, this is a battle that we face. And even though the battle is fierce, as followers of Jesus, we should always, 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 always remember that God is faithful. And because God is faithful, we should remain faithful. As followers of Jesus, we need to realize and be reminded that we are in a battle, the battle between the way of Cain, the way of man, the way of the serpent, the way of the devil, and the way of God. We should always choose the way of God because he is faithful. Every head bowed and every eye closed, please. Lord God, we thank you for this time in your word. Lord, the way of God is the way of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. We celebrate that this week. We should celebrate it every week. Lord, if there's anybody in this room who's never committed their life to you, I pray that your spirit is speaking to them, having them to admit that they followed the way of Cain, but today they believe in the way of God that they would confess their sin and believe that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, that he rose on the third day and that he's coming back. And that plan can never be thwarted no matter how bad it may seem in our world. Lord, I pray that they would hear your spirit speak to them. Lord, for us who have been followers of Christ, we live in a dark world. We live in a world that's gone the way of Cain. But let us be faithful because you have been so good to us, so faithful to us when we have been faithless. Let us repent and live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.